good afternoon. Sorry, good afternoon. Good morning again, and uh, welcome to this section uh, on social determinants of health, family economics, uh, post section one. And uh, today we have twelve papers. So according to the plan, I think we just go through the papers uh, on the list, and uh, each paper will have roughly five minutes, including both presentation and uh, Q and A section. So. I would like to invite our first presenter, Anne from University of Melbourne. Could you uh, unmute yourself and perhaps share your slides or, yeah. Hello, everybody. You, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good morning. Um, let me start my slides. Uh, uh, okay. So it means that I need to share my screen, is that correct? Okay, can you see my poster? Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Anne Tron from University of Melbourne. Um, so now I'm, my understanding is that I have two minutes to present my poster. Um, so we will start right away uh, by uh, saying that um, uh, a little bit about the background of this study. Uh, there has been increasing interest in understanding the long-term evolution of inequalities. Uh, why there is substantial evidence on the increase in income gaps over the, the last few decades. Uh, little is known about the changes in disparities in health, including life expectancy. So in this study, we aim to examine the long run uh, evolution of inequality in terms of life expectancy between politicians and the general population in 11 countries. The reason why we chose politicians because they represent an elite group whose birth and death data are available over a long period of time. Um, from this study, we collected data from 11 countries, uh, including Australia, Austria, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Switzerland, the UK, and the US, where data of both politicians and the general population were available. Uh, for this study to estimate the life expectancy of the public politicians, we fitted the Gompers parametric proportional hazard model to data in consecutive 10 years time window. And then we use the, this model to estimate the remaining life expectancy of uh, individuals aged 40 years. The results show that if you look at this, uh, you see that um, the um, survival advantage of partition compared to general population widened considerably uh, over the 20th century. Uh, so you see that here, the um, Blue line represent the life expectancy of partition, and the red line represent the life expectancy of general population. And you see that uh, during the 20th century, there has been a steadily increase in life expectancy of both partition and general population. And the patterns are strikingly consistent across 11 countries here. Um, this uh, graph shows you the gaps in life expectancy between the partition and general population. And you see that the pattern is also very uh, consistent. Uh, during the 20th century, you see that uh, the gaps increase over time here. Uh, although recently, the gaps uh, decreased a little bit because of the improvement in the life expectancy of the general population. Uh, the maximum gaps range from uh, 4.4 years in the Netherlands here. So this is the, the maximum gap, minimum of maximum gap. And the uh, maximum gap thus is, is the, uh, the highest maximum gap is in USA, whereas the gap is 7.8 years. Um, so we hypothesized that the income, education, and healthcare gaps have been significant factors contribute to the long run inequalities and life expectancies between politicians and the general populations. Um, we show that we provide the evidence to increase the awareness among the population and populations of the growing health gaps between them. 
and this could lead to the policy debates on how to close the gaps in life expectancy between the elites and the channel populations. That, that's my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Can I invite some questions from the floor? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, I think it's so, quite an interesting study. I, I, probably my question is more a clarification question. Oh, sorry, did I interrupt someone? Denzel, are you speak? Sorry. Yeah, it was me. Um, yeah, go ahead. I should actually put it. Um, so I'm interested in this, this uh, turning point, which seems to be consistent across the data. So how do I, how do I, so you, you said that's to do with um, uh, uh, the improved health of the, the non-politicians, but is, could it also be interpreted that the, the politicians have reached some ceiling level in terms of longevity? <laughs> and so that's the best you can get? Yeah, can we? Thanks for the question. I think it is a good question. But if you look at this, you see that uh, as a trend shows in 11 countries, that you see that uh, the life expectancy of the politician continues to increase, although in some countries, it seems to be a uh, level of, especially, for example, in Australia, you see that it's less tendency that the rate of increase in life expectancy of politicians has been reduced. But if you look at Austria or you look at the uh, France, for example, you see that trend here, life expectancy of politicians continue to increase. So uh, I think the gaps uh, here, uh, is reducing the reduction of the gaps here might be 10 fold maybe uh, a little bit reduction in life expectancy of the partition and improvement in general population. Um, hi, Anne. Um, so uh, I was just wondering if you, if you control for any other um, factors like behavioral or any other thing, just, just noting that politicians generally don't tend to be the healthiest of individuals as, as far as Australians anyway. Uh, yeah, um, and it can be uh, several hypotheses here. Uh, if we look at in the 19th century, we saw that a lot of politicians smoke a lot and it affects uh, their health. That's why you see that during the 19th century, there were periods where the life expectancy of politicians was lower than general population. Uh, but recently, I think that uh, if we look at the income um, uh, discrep discrepancies between partition and general population, especially if you look at UK, you see that uh, the incomes of partitions are much more higher than general population, and especially when they use income to improve health. Uh, 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 I think this is maybe a, a special case, but if you look at the past when Donald Trump had um, COVID, and he was treated with vaccine, was one of the first person to receive vaccination. So uh, this maybe demonstrates that politicians maybe have some privilege in healthcare. So in Australia, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that usually um, politicians in charge the privilege in terms of healthcare compared to general populations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ta Thank you. Uh, I think on to the time, we have to move to the second paper. Thank you, Anne. Thanks. Uh, can Thank I invite the, also for the second paper, thanks, Anne. Uh, talking about the correlation between depression and health evidence for national survey in Japan. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Thank you. Okay. So hello, everyone. I'm Yui Otsu from Saitama University in Japan. Uh, in our study, we analyzed the relationship of poverty and health uh, using not only income, but also deprivation as poverty measurement. Deprivation is defined as enforced lack of items which are considered to be necessities by majority of the population and compensates the limitation that income is an indirect measure of living standards. We used microdata from Japanese National Survey on Social Security and People's Life in 2017 and conducted binomial logic model analysis. 
an analysis with binary variables related to health as a dependent variables and poverty indicators are the experimental variables. The, uh, the result of this study uh, can be summarized in the following three points. First, even NAFTA controlling for the effect of relative poverty and social demographic factors, the more severe the de de deprivation, the worse the health status tends to be. Second, differ difference uh, differences in health status by relative poverty or not are reduced or not observed when controlling for the effect of deprivation. Third, there is an interaction between relative poverty and deprivation, as there is the health of those who are in relative poverty and suffer from higher deprivation may be significantly worse. So this result indicates that the deprivation index has an effect independent of but larger than income poverty. This implies that the deprivation index captures aspects of poverty that cannot be measured by income poverty, and that is closely related to health. Therefore, when analyzing the relationship between poverty and health, it is necessary, uh, it is necessary to understand poverty from multiple perspectives using not only income, but also non-mandatory non indicators, such as deprivation indicators. Uh, uh, that all, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do you have questions or suggestions? Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. I suppose I perhaps have a question. So you've used uh, poor, uh, just self-rated health. Are there potentially other measures of health that might be a little bit, I mean, uh, you know, give a sort of fine aggregation uh, over levels of health or, a, a, for example, an EQ5D or an index or something else, or is there just the self-reported health that you can use here? Sorry, could you say? Uh, so, so you've used uh, just your self-reported health, but are there, is there a sort of uh, a mo are there, is there an index that can rate health? I mean, you've got to, uh, or is it just a, in the survey? Is there any other data you could use to measure health? Uh, you. Uh, we use the uh, uh, we use the health indicators uh, not only for self-rated health. Uh, we use activity act limitations and uh, severe mental illness based on uh, K six indicators. So, oh, well. Mm. So, so what you? I was just, I suppose, do you, you have a sort of like a generic quality of life instrument, or is it just you've only got a single question? And I, I suppose the other question is all the data is self reported. So, how much uh, of perhaps if you use more objective measures? How much? Uh, how different would it be? Uh, uh, it, uh, in this indicator, it's only one single. Uh, 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 this indicates uh, uh, what's based on only single questions. Uh, for example, uh, for example, as for per self like rated health. Uh, this is a this is a single question. Uh, uh, what is your situation uh, uh, health situation and 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 there are five choices of for answering and uh, so it's not so this this uh, 
so this indicates or or uh, just only one, uh, one aspect of general questions so Thanks. I think that's uh, sorry, something, you know, something to think about yeah, yeah. whether you know you have your subjective uh, outcome measure here, but whether you can think about other more objective uh, health measures as well. And uh, if you are thinking, uh, okay, on in short time, we move to the next paper. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, now, can I uh, invite the third presenter, Chun Chen, to present? Uh, the study on gender differences in trajectories of self-rated health among Chinese older adults. Oh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, wait a minute, yes. let me choose a website. Oh. Yeah. Uh, can you see the, the screen? Hello, everyone. My name is Chun Chen from Wenzhou Medical University in China. The title of my presentation is Gender Differences in Trajectory of self Health Among Chinese Old Adults. Uh, as we know, the previous study which focused on Chinese old adults will uh, use the pro data or concessional data, which uh, were ignoring the dynamic changes in males and females' self health status over time. Furthermore, longitudinal studies, especially that focus on old adults, will typically suffer from the incompletions of data. So the effect of dropout data on the uh, trajectory of self health is unknown. So we aim to examine the gender differences or trajectory of self health data under the now ignorable job date, dropout data assumptions. We are uh, and uh, we include four wave of data from 2005 to 2014. And uh, we use a pattern mixture model, a special latent growth model to examine the trajectory of these studies. The result shows uh, that the now ignorable uh, job out data assumption is worked in these studies because you can see the self health uh, the previous self health score is associated with the uh, job out data and uh, the now ignorable uh, and, and the gender did not uh, predict any changes or, or intercept slope and the quadratic of the trajectory of self health. So we draw the conclusion that under non-ignorable job out date assumptions, uh, no gender difference were found in trajectories of self health among Chinese old adults. That's all. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And, uh, if you have any questions and uh, suggestions. Thank you. Any questions, suggestions? And Shun, I think that's a very interesting study. And you have three model specifications that I can see here. Uh, you choose your model based on model, uh, good news three, the model C. Could you just briefly talk about you know, the difference between these three model specifications? Because it wasn't quite clear from the graph. It's a bit small. Well, too quick, I think. The, I use the um, free model to choose the best fitted model. Like the model one is a linear latent ghost model, and the model B is a free time latent ghost model, and the model C is a quadratic latent ghost model. So after compare the the fit, uh, uh, we in the model selection information you can see the model C, the quadratic latent ghost model, is the best fit one. So based on this result, we include uh, the time invariant and the time varying 
dependent uh, independent variables in this model and uh, to this is a concept frame of this uh, study and the general conclusion <laughs> so the basic result is uh, gender didn't predict any difference in the trajectory of self and health and uh, the another important result is the uh, dropout does impact the uh, the self and health the previous self health does impact the dropout as we know the elder the longitudinal elder studies will suffer from some elder is too free, uh, frail, frail to participate in survey or their diet. So the dropout data is important to, if we delay it, the result will be too optimistic, I think. So. Thanks. Well, what sort of age was not there? Uh, uh, 65, over 65. Over 65, right. I was more thinking about some subgroups, uh, potentially with say, uh, older population with uh, all these old, whether there will be some difference being observed, but yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, any other questions, suggestions? Okay, <laughs> thank you, Chun, and, oh, sorry, did I? Oh, yeah, I was just um, hoping to ask uh, um, if, if you found that the, um, the latent growth model, if you're, you're looking for something a little bit more kind of nuanced in terms of, of capturing other, other variables, I know that's a kind of a limitation of the modeling that, that you can either kind of choose to do a, a cross-sectional or, or a growth model, but did you, did you find anything that kind of combined the two and, and, and allowed a little, little bit more flexibility? Uh... Um, because the result is, is a little different from the previous uh, conclusions, like in the previous study, we could draw the, that a woman have a, a female have a worse self and health and then males, but they tend to live longer. But the result of our study, which draws the different, the, oh, by the table one, we can see the self and health is did, did a significant difference between male, female and male, but the trajectory of the self health is uh, no, uh, there are no difference in the trajectory change between male and females. So <laughs> I, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, on to the time, we need to move on to the next paper. Thank you. Too. Uh, Thank you. Can I invite the next speaker? Uh, Okay, uh, how, to, how to close it? Done, so, uh, you can unshare, presumably. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, can I invite Dan Cao? Okay. Uh, can you see my uh, poster? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Cao Dan, and I'm from Xianjiang University in China. The title of of my study is the impact of spousal chronic health shock on subjective well-being among elderly in China and urban rural dimension. As we all know that chronic disease, including hypertension, stroke, and so on, are threatening more and more families in China, especially in elderly households. And chronic conditions will bring not only heavy economic burden to families, but also negative uh, emotional and mental impacts to patients and their family members. Couples who live together are so closely related to each other's living environment. Therefore, chronic health shock of one family member can also affect spousal life quality and health. So the aim of this study is to explore the effect of chronic health shock of elderly people on sp spousal a subjective well-being in China from an urban rural dimension. And we used the, uh, the CHNS, the China Health and Nutri Nutrition Survey. Uh, it is a nationally representative data. And in, in this survey, if the respondent spouse answered no for all chronic diseases in 2011, but answered yes for any chronic disease in 2015, then he or she was regarded to experience 
also chronic health shock and character characterized into treatment group and otherwise a control group. And we use the PSM method to avoid self-selection problem. And this table shows the uh, propensity score matching estimated from the effect, for the effect of treatment. And from the results, we can see that for urban area, the results confirm our expectation that also chronic health shock has a negative in effect on, uh, on SWB of elderly. However, for the rural area, the effect was not statist statistically significant. And these two figures are the uh, uh, OLS regression after PSM in urban and rural sample uh, respectively. And this suggests a similar result. The 95% confidence intervals of treatment in rural and urban samples do not overlap each other, which suggests that the impacts in rural and urban areas have statistically significant differences. And um, we can explain several ways of the influence mechanism. Economic burden, uh, caregiver, and lack of family support are all potential reasons for the negative effect of spousal chronic health shock. And compared with urban residents, rural residents are usually worse educated. They have lower con consciousness and understanding level, level of happiness. Besides, Rural elderly usually have more accesses to participate in um, working work, in working than urban elderly, and rural households in China usually consist of more members than urban households. That, these may be potential reasons for the urban rural difference. Um, uh, so that's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any questions, suggestions? So I have a question. So it's clear that the urban rural differences are there, but it would seem to me the other obvious split to look at the data is by gender. Have you done that? Uh, no, I haven't so, done that yet. Yeah, so, but so I, I think, think it, in, um, yeah, I think it's a good idea because um, um, men and women also have some um, different feelings about happiness and uh, chronic conditions. Yeah. I, th I think in previous work that have looked at this sort of stuff, where they've looked at working age people there, they do find a, an asymmetric effect, which is probably as you would expect. But here it would be interesting to see if that gets replicated here, because these are uh, elderly. And so issues about, um, you know, uh, 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 labor force participation, uh, a bit more, a bit different in this group relative to uh, working age population. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and yeah. yep. oh, sorry. sorry. Just, just wondering um, how you define the health shock here? Chronic health um, shock. Uh, uh, we used the two pa uh, a panel data actually, and um, and the CHNS contains uh, two uh, 2011 and 2015. So um, and if the if the one if the uh, resident answered no for any chronic disease, in that he didn't get any chronic disease in 2011, but how? Uh, on uh, have a chronic disease in 2015. So uh, we define that he has experienced the chronic sh shock that because he, uh, uh, because he, uh, he, um, because he didn't get a, a disease in 2011, but uh, had a disease in 2015. Uh, can you understand? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we need to move on to the next paper. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and then can I okay. invite Yue Wu to share your slides. Thanks. Uh, hello. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Chen. Uh, this is Yue Wu. I'm from 
uh, San Jiangtou University, China, and my research is social network types Hi. and the. Hi, yes, so, sorry to interrupt. Uh, do, would you like to share your slides or poster or oh, you prefer yeah, to yeah, speak? Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Just, okay, no worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me try to. Sorry, I'm trying to do it. Uh, or maybe oh. I can share your screen as well. Is is this a the, your poster? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Thank you can you, so you can so speak. <laughs> okay, uh, this is you have and uh, uh, my research is social network types and the euro uh, 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 euro urban and rural health dis disparity among the elderly in China, and uh, my research background is. Uh, the social network type is a uh, compar composition, uh, composite char characterized of the interpersonal media in which people are in, 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 in embedded and uh, and a imp very important in indicator of social capital, and it has been proved to have significant impact on older populations' health outcomes. This study, uh, uh uh, this study is um, is identified the SNS SNTS of China uh, Chinese older and adults and examined uh, whether SNTS contribute to the the health disparity um, between uh, rural and urban elderly and uh, the method uh, part is uh, uh, more than. Uh, more than 8,000 um, participants uh, aged uh, six, uh, 60 years old uh, people and um, from the U uh, China Health and the uh, Retirement Longitudinal Survey were, uh, were analyzed. And the instrumental ac activity of daily living scores and the depressive symptoms scores uh, surveyed center for epidemiologic study depression scale scores used to marry the physical and mental health. SNTS were identified by Kimi's cluster analysis. Analy uh, analysis. Oscar and the blood did test Mm, that the composition analysis was used to examine the contribution of uh, SNTs in urban rural health disparity. And the conver conversations including age, age, age gender, non-communication disorders, the state or self-related health, the education, income, work status, uh, housing condition, community discussion, and the errands. And uh, uh, from this uh, uh, picture, we can uh, see that uh, five uh, SNTs were found uh, in our research, uh, it in, uh, including uh, diversity, friend, uh, fr uh, child, comfort, and the restricted. Mm, they were uh, named based on the, uh, the this uh, these eight uh, variables, which were you, uh, which were uh, used to, which were used to uh, cluster the uh, the SNTs, and uh, uh, the second result is that uh, rural elderly have higher uh, higher IADL scores and the CID uh, scores than urban elderly, which means uh, which means. Uh, 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 the the elderly in rural area uh, in rural area ha, uh, has a bad uh, health status, and uh, uh, the last result is that as NPs have char characteristic uh, effect and the coefficient effect on the rural uh, urban rural health disparity uh, with controlled conversion uh, mm, and. Then we have the conclusion that the disparity of uh, SNT. Oh, sorry, I didn't display the uh, display the 
the, the disparity between SMTs, uh, we also found that SMTs between rural and elderly, they have some kind of uh, difference. And this difference also contribute to the, their health, physical and met, uh, met, mental health disparity. And uh, this idea of uh, this understanding of this uh, association could encourage a program designed to enhance healthy energy uh, equally uh, by improving the bridging social capital of uh, rural and older adults respectively and uh, mm, respectively. And uh, that's my uh, mm, uh, uh, over, overview of my research and uh, uh, and uh, thank you for your uh, listening. That's all, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any questions, suggestions? That was quite Chen here, uh, Anton from University of Melbourne. Um, I, I just wonder why you focus on depressions. Uh, uh, this, I mean, the question there were uh, related to depressions on, and um, did it represent also the other health conditions as well? Uh. Sorry, I didn't follow you. Can you repeat the last yeah. question? So, um, when look at the you use the instrumental activities uh, of daily living scores and depressive symptom score, yeah. and what were reason why you focus on depression and not on the other chronic diseases or the other conditions? Oh. Uh... I think uh, mm, many many thanks for your question. I think uh, mm, the scores uh, uh, may may be a kind of um, uh, a kind of measurement which were uh, used uh, widely in the research. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I choose uh, eight. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Thank I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, on your time, I'm going to move on to the next study. Uh, thanks, Yue. Uh, I'm going to unshare my screen and can I also invite the next speaker talking about towards one health, I think. Uh, let, me, let me unshare my screen. Uh, hi, Chen. Let me share my screen. Hi. Yes, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ahmad Kim. I'll be taking through um, the topic attending universal health coverage, leaving no one behind, decomposing uh, maternal health, socioeconomic inequalities in Zimbabwe. Well, this will be my presentation outline, um, background, the methods, results, discussion, then take home messages and concluding remarks. So uh, Sub-Saharan Africa um, statistically have been reporting women dying uh, yearly due to pregnancy complications or childbirth uh, related complications which a uh, majority of, of of the deaths actually resulting due to uh, skilled birth uh, delivery uh, attendance shortages therefore improving accessibility and strengthening the quality of uptake of maternal health uh, attendance uh, or maternal health services usage is important in reducing maternal health deaths um, Zimbabwe is to the south of Africa, and it's part of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 
um, using the 2010 11 statistics, um, 10 women died every day due to pregnancy related complications in Zimbabwe. With an equity analysis done on 12 maternal health and child uh, indicators reflecting that in 54 countries, skilled birth uh, attendance coverage uh, was the least equitable maternal health uh, indicator with a 52% difference between the wealthiest and the poorest. So our study um, assessed uh, maternal health utilization, mainly on skilled birth attendance, antenatal care and postnatal care uh, using the Erich Gray's normalized indices, and which were later decomposed to understand the contribution uh, of each of uh, um, the maternal health uh, service usage. Our results show that uh, overall maternal health utilization uh, on skilled birth attendance, it was actually significantly higher than what was reported in the demographic health survey, uh, which is uh, the data set that we're using for this analysis. While this uh, decomposition analysis also showed that household wealth, uh, spouses, education, and residential uh, status were important positive contributors um, to the three maternal health indicators that we, we analyzed. Uh, our results show that uh, across the three maternal health indicators, um, there were pro-rich inequalities, uh, which translate that uh, all the, the maternal health services usages actually favored the rich. And um, you can see from the table that is to my right, uh, showing the absolute uh, contribution percentages, which are mostly highlighted in red that household wealth, um, delivery place, and antenatal care were uh, significant contributors to um, driving, uh, were actually drivers of uh, skilled birth attendance inequalities. So our study showed the existence of health-related inequalities in the service up in maternal health service uptake um, in Zimbabwe across socioeconomic demographic characteristics with high utilization rates reported actually among rural women, which was quite interesting. Um, also with uh, distance to health facilities generally influenced by women's perception of the Matena health service quality in Zimbabwe. The take home messages that we can, uh, we actually drew from this uh, research uh, was that household wealth, uh, is an important determinant in maternal health usage as well as women's education. Therefore, there is need to actually encourage or increase maternal health information or education across women, especially in low income settings. Uh, therefore, the study concludes that an effective way to reduce inequalities is not only to narrow the gap of income between the poor and rich, but also focus on educating women and the, on the importance of uh, maternal health service usage. With that, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I wonder whether this maternal health service, are, are they covered by the health insurance or they are not? Or is out of pocket money? So some of uh, the services are covered currently in Zimbabwe uh, at the primary healthcare facilities, but at tertiary institutions, um, there is a sort of fee that you're charged um, depending on also where the location of the tertiary institution is but mostly in within rural settings, nothing is currently being paid, but in urban areas, there's a, a minimal fee that is actually charged for, for access. All right, thanks. Any other suggestions or comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, we move on to the next study. Uh, by Laura.
Uh, Laura, could you share your screen? Sure. Thank you. Um, can you see that? Almost, yes. Okay, great. So good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or wherever anybody is. Um, I'm Laura Rousseau, I'm from the University of the Witwatersrand. Um, I'm going to excuse myself from sharing my video uh, because of poor internet connection, so sorry about that. So my presentation is about period poverty, um, so socioeconomic inequalities in menstrual hygiene management um, and health in eight low and, lower and middle income countries. Um, so menstrual hygiene management and health, or MHM for short, is a rather neglected but crucial field in health economics. And ensuring that women and girls have access to safe, clean, and private MHM spaces and products has uh, potential labor market and economic out, uh, consequences as well as educational uh, consequences. But crucially, it's really important for promoting dignity and gender equality. And while there have been various policy attempts uh, to improve MHM, in, including tax reduction and free distribution programs, there remains large gaps between those that have adequate access and those that do not. Um, and of course, these gaps are across, uh, are specifically along socioeconomic lines. So using some of the few nationally representative data sets uh, collected that include MHM data uh, outcome measures, namely PMA 2020, um, uh, we use irregular uh, corrected concentration indices and decomposition methods to measure inequality in MHM in eight low and middle income countries. This includes the DRC, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Uganda. And I'm just gonna highlight some of the key findings. So one of the most concerning areas was in terms of safety. So across most stu uh, countries studied, um, one to two out of the three uh, women did not have access to safe lockable MHM spaces. And although these results were ubiquitous, obviously when we looked at the concentration indices, uh, these numbers were even more con were concentrated among the poor. And a major contributor to these uh, and other MHM space inequalities are differences in wealth, um, education, and infrastructure, which really factors into the fact that what we know about the fact that planning and design of sanitation systems rarely incorporates the needs and practices of, of women. And there were also large differences between those who have access to uh, commercial image products like sanitary pads. Um, but the, the thing I really wanna highlight is the thing that we are not measuring here, which is ongoing stigmatization, which really disallows an ongoing discussion of the problems women um, and girls experience of MHM. And this makes it difficult to identify solutions. Um, and also a lot of the, the policy programs that have been rolled out and implemented have not been rigorously evaluated um, or investigated. Um, and so we now actually know very little about the effectiveness of a lot of these MHM policies being rolled out. Um, and that it's a, a crucial step going forward is to collect more data on, on MHM indicators so that we can, we're able to say even more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Any suggestions, questions for Laura? I guess, Laura, one, one thing I would try to think when you're listening to your presentation, you try to think in is among those things you identify, do you know which one, which is more, you know, cost effective to be intervened from the policymaker's perspective? Well, so, I mean, I think that's the point is that very few of these interventions have actually been implemented. Um, taxation, um, actually, usually, while it, like taxation can often be a cost effective strategy because it's at a national, it can be implemented at national level. Um, Often the, the taxes that are being removed are value added taxes um, and they form a very small percentage of the actual retail price. Um, 
And so they're very, they're crucial in getting the conversation going on the topic. Um, they often, the actual effect of removing the taxes are quite small. Um, and uh, free distribution programs often have uh, implementation problems. So for instance, South Africa, where I'm based, um, there is actually free distribution of sanitary pads in low income quintile schools, but uh, we know that in only, it's only being rolled out in half, half of the provinces. So really the step forward is to realize, you know, what is the most cost effective strategy? Um, and, and it does not only entail addressing MH products, but also looking at, you know, sanitary systems and um, ensuring safe and lockable spaces. And that's often not um, seen as the main policy point um, or not focused on as much as the free distribution of products. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Any uh, final questions? Okay, thanks, Laura. Thank you. Uh, can we move to the next study? Uh, looking at health shops and household location of tunnel spending. Thanks. Uh, okay, I can share now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, give me a sec. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Um, so uh, the experience of uh, um, health condition of uh, uh, serious uh, injuries or illnesses have a, a, a serious implication on many aspects of uh, uh, people's life. In this paper, we uh, study how uh, an health shock uh, has an effect on the uh, consumption spending of the household and on the uh, allocation of time uh, spent by the um, person that is affected by the health shock and by the unaffected spouse. Uh, in uh, uh, our paper, uh, we use a uh, uh, longitudinal uh, uh, study that is representative uh, uh, of the Australian population, the household income and labor dynamics in Australia. We identify the health shock uh, as an experience of a, a serious injury or illness uh, in the past uh, 12 months. And uh, we select the uh, sample of people that can be observed for five years. Uh, in these five years, uh, we want that uh, the two years prior to the health shock, uh, this person doesn't experience any uh, health shock. We want that this person for the whole period, for the whole five years, uh, has a spouse. And this spouse uh, doesn't have to experience any health shock uh, over the entire period or over the five years. Um, after we restrict uh, to this, uh, after we apply to this restriction, we have uh, uh, a bit more than uh, 1,200 uh, uh, observation. We apply a, a time event research design in which we uh, regress our outcome on the uh, uh, time effect, on the uh, fixed effect, uh, and on a, a series uh, of uh, indicators that uh, represent uh, uh, the time relative to the health shock. And uh, we see that uh, uh, when we apply um, the uh, time event research design, we see that at the time of the shock, uh, the person that is affected by the shock has a, a strong drop in the uh, physical health and in the mental uh, health. Uh, this uh, physical health, this mental health are measured with uh, um, uh, um, the, the, uh, some indexes that are provided in ILDA uh, and they are, they, they are derived from the short uh, form 36. We also see 
that there is a, at the time of the shock a strong drop in the time spent at work for the person affected by the shock. Uh, while we don't see much uh, of a response uh, for the spouse. We see, uh, however, uh, uh, an increase in the uh, uh, time spent in on production activities for the, for the spouse. On production activities can be housework, uh, uh, time spent in outdoor activities, or uh, time spent shopping. Uh, or also time spent in carry. And it's actually in time spent in carry that we see the, the highest, the largest increase, uh, because we see that at the time of the shock, the unaffected spouse increases the uh, time spent in caring by 6%. At the same time, what we find uh, regarding health spending, uh, spending on health-related goods, such as uh, a prescription of doctors, out-of-pocket uh, 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 money on uh, to practitioners, and private health insurance increases by 13%, while the other um, uh, the, the, the spending on uh, uh, non-health-related uh, goods uh, remains uh, quite uh, uh, stable and slightly decreased by only 1%. One, 1%. Uh, in this paper, uh, we actually uh, conclude saying that uh, uh, when we uh, analyze health shock, uh, it's important that uh, we look, uh, uh, we take into account on behavioral response, not only for the person that is affected by the shock, but also for, uh, by the, uh, for responses, behavioral responses of this unaffected spouse. Thank you. Uh, we probably have time for one question. I, I have a question. Well, I, yeah, then, I can re recycle my previous question about, uh, it would be interesting to see this broken up by, <laughs> by gender. Uh, but my, my more, I think my, my main question is about the health expenditure. So I've actually never, this is for people, maybe not, not of interest for non-Australians, but. I've never used the spending components of HILDA. I'm just wo worried about the reliability of the expenditure data in HILDA. And in particular, in this case, the salience of uh, health spending, given they've just had a health shock. So I'm just wondering whether part of this large increase is because previously they they, it hasn't been a very salient uh, um, uh, uh, expenditure for them. And so they haven't bothered really about reporting all the health expenditures but now they've had the health shock, they start thinking seriously about how much money they've spent on health. Yes, uh, uh, on the re reliability of, of uh, uh, consumption spending of ILDA, uh, if there, is, there are a measurement error, they should be there all year. So they somehow they could be eliminated by uh, the, um, uh, fixed effect. Um, in terms of uh, spending uh, uh, on uh, health-related goods, there could be, that's right, that could be a slight increase, but if I, they had an health shock, it's very likely that they actually uh, increase the spending on uh, uh, health goods, because I mean, uh, uh, prior to the shock, if you don't go to the doctor, uh, probably, um, I mean, you you, you don't uh, spend anything on on uh, uh, doctor's prescription or uh, fees to the practitioners. While when you actually have the the health shock, uh, you 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 go to the doctor and 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 you spend some money. Uh, and uh, same for medicines, right? I mean, you consume uh, uh, medicines uh, and you buy medicines. I mean you increase the, the, the purchase of, of medicines when uh, you actually feel uh, uh, ill, not uh, when, when, uh, when you're healthy. Yeah, I'm Thank happy you, to owing the time. Okay. <laughs> Gendo, sorry, owing the time, I have to move to the next paper and uh, yeah, probably we'll keep the discussion later on. Thank you. Thanks, and by the way. Thanks, can I, yeah, can I invite the next speaker talking about Air, uh, reduction in air pollution and infant mortality. Thank you. Hello. 
just sharing my screen. Uh, here it is. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so right. Um, uh, hello, uh, my name is Lexi Kirchenk. I'm a PG candidate at Surge AI, uh, PG candidate in economics at Surge AI in Czech uh, pra uh, in, in Prague, Czech Republic. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of this session and uh, present this uh, um, so results of my paper, the impact of the crisis and its reduction in air pollution on Intel mortality in India policy perspective. So uh, just just in brief, uh, my policy focus on uh, on um, or evolve, evolves around the question, this policy important question, whether and to, to what extent improvements in air quality in developing countries lead to improvements in health outcome. And this topic is important because air pollution is actually is a grave concern in much of the developing world. It leads to, to a million, millions of uh, uh, fatalities and, and uh, lead to enormous economic costs. And uh, unfortunately, many developing countries avoid to commit themselves to, to reduction in air pollution because they just fear that like uh, economic costs of abatement policies uh, will not uh, uh, will be covered. So uh, we will, will, will exceed the, the, the uh, associated health benefits. And the problem is also ex exacerbated by the uh, lack of uh, empirical research on the, on the health benefits of uh, air pollution uh, control policies. And in this research, I try to fill this, this, this niche by, uh, by examining the effect of reduction in uh, one, one episode of reduction in air pollution on infant mortality in India. So um, I would like to have some sort of natural experiment uh, uh, environment. So and, uh, in, in my research, I take, uh, I take advantage of the economic slowdown uh, caused by the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, and that wasn't like uh, India escaped the global financial crisis, escaped like complete economic crisis. But so it's just episode of like brief and, uh, uh, and um, like temporal um, a, a reduction in economic activities. But nevertheless, this, uh, this uh, uh, slowdown uh, led to synchronous decline in industrial production, reduction in air pollution and improvement in mortality. So I combine all these to answer three uh, research questions. Uh, I'm, so I'm, um, did the crisis and this reduction in air pollution cause the decline in infant mortality? And what, what, what are the transmission mechanisms? And uh, what are monetary values? Uh, I mean, what are, what, what are benefits of, of, of this one episode of reduction? So uh, to 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 so I, I created a like, panel of district by year uh, um, variables for 284 districts across nine states in India for a period 2007 2011. So it covers exactly the period of crisis. So uh, I use like um, mortality related variables uh, and uh, mortality related controls were drawn from annual health survey of India. This is a panel uh, DHS like uh, survey. So I created um, many versions of infant mortality rates variable, like for all causes for different symptoms of death and uh, at, uh, infant mortality, it's a, a different uh, uh, period of lives uh, within one year. And uh, so for uh, air pollution, I, I, I use the satellite derived estimates uh, from very popular in social sciences uh, uh, database, database by one Don Killer, uh, this atmospheric composition analysis group in, in, in Canada. So my main variable of interest is uh, district level, annual district level, uh, average concentration of particulate matter with the aerodynamic diameter 2.5. I also uh, try to, to account for confounded factors like income per capita, annual uh, temperature and precipitation, wind speed and direction using different uh, satellite derived uh, data sets. For, for an empirical uh, strategy, I, I, I use uh, um, uh, different diff uh, setting with different um, uh, slopes. So and uh, so the, the using crisis as, as a sort of natural experiments lead to to two actually uh, methodological uh, problems or, or challenges. So like how to define this variable cost and how to define this variable uh, treated or affected. So and uh, for for the first case, I defined variable post using like trend break analysis on, on the time series of, of uh, air pollution. So I, I detected like trend break, like brand, uh, break in upper trend in air pollution in 2010. And you know, there's like test window and every, every, every time this test, test window included 2010, uh, it was highly statistically significant. And then for, 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 uh, for, for uh, sorting like treatment and uh, treated and, and control districts, I use several approaches. One of them like, like a hotspot analysis because I, I noticed that like the districts like declining air pollution was uh, some 
how are spatially clustered. So this hotspot analysis from uh, from geospatial sciences uh, like like allows to distinguish between districts which here in blue they were 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 substantially affected with declining air pollution. This, those in yellow like like sort of control control groups and uh, here some of the districts uh, uh, somehow experience like increase in air pollution. So um, my, my results are following. So answering these three questions, I found that like uh, answering the first first one uh, that uh, I found that uh, in infant mortality rates fell for 24 percent more in the affected districts uh, compared to uh, control districts during the post crisis period. And um, uh, this tables this table of like combined results like uh, sh also shows that my estimates are robust and uh, to different alternative explanations and specifications. Uh, answering the, the second question, question I found that uh, like effect is strongest is post neonatal period, and effect is uh, and effect is also specific to respiratory diseases. This is what I wanted to show, and also like like moving my my uh, analysis into the policy perspective, I use the. Uh, quantify a uh, relationship between air pollution and nuclear mortality. And I found that uh, during this only one episode, uh, about uh, uh, 1,300 infant lives uh, were saved uh, due to re uh, the reduction in air pollution, which contributed to, to about 11% to the overall overall decline in infant mortality. And uh, I um, using the uh, value of statistical life, uh, life for, for, for India, I monetize uh, these uh, um, uh, gains uh, to be uh, equivalent to uh, three, three uh, hundred uh, uh, millions US dollar uh, for for only this uh, period. So uh, this to uh, conclude. So uh, I answered my question and found that uh, um, the effect was substantial and uh, these estimates can be can be used as a, as a uh, as a uh, like benchmark uh, benefits for air pollution control policies in India. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting study, and you have used all your, your time. So can I just say any, any quick, quick, uh, quick questions from the audience? Um, hi, Alexi. I, I'm wondering, um, did, did the, was there much inter-regional migration that you noticed, or was there any data on that just out of interest? I mean, ch children are expected to stay fairly close to home, not go to a different location for work and that sort of thing. So it's, it's pretty good study design. Thank you very much. This is a very important question indeed. And uh, so uh, I, 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 use, I use, as I said, I used a survey based uh, like a panel version uh, uh, of uh, DHS like uh, surveys, household and, 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 and health survey. It was conducted in three rounds, three consecutive, three consecutive years. And actually, I I uh, I noticed like uh, there is one question whether uh, those like uh, households were present in the same district during like uh, all these years, and so this is how I uh, I I detected that uh, migration is actually uh, not, not 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 a problem. So I ruled out this this uh, possibility. But also the, there are, I also refer to to some uh, um, empirical evidence in, in literature that suggests that uh, inter uh, like inter uh, like migration in India between districts are, and in general very very limited especially at this 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 period of time so uh, I, I somehow uh, like um, deal with this question this, this way but but if there's any you know sort of uh, more rigorous way to deal with this so uh, I mean if, if, if you know I would be happy to hear it thank you no, no. thank you oh. I will leave your discussion later on. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, can I invite the next speaker talking about? Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Transitioning into uh, obese India, and uh, I think I will help share that. Uh, uh, hi, 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 Gang. I can share oh, hi, my. Oh, hi, uh, you are here. Oh, perfect. I'm up please. Here. Yes, go ahead. I can share my yeah. presentation, but in case I get disconnected, please uh, you will start sharing and I can speak from my phone. So I'm logged in no from problems. Google. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Can you all uh, see my screen? Yes. So, yeah. So hello everyone, I am Sunena Jhingra, Assistant Professor at Open General Global University. And today I'm gonna to present my work, joint work with uh, Anaga Ayer and Professor Prabhu Pingali explaining the OV trends in India. 
So the overweight incidence among Indian adults has doubled over a, a short span of 10 years. A, a deeper investigation a deeper investigation re reveals that there were two main within country differences in overweight growth patterns. First, the rapid increase in this prevalence has emerged from rural areas, which were more likely to be facing issues of undernutrition and food insecurity in the past. And second is that it was the fast rising male overweight, um, uh, overweight increase in uh, overweight prevalence, which drove the decadal increase, although women overweight prevalence continues to be higher. So in this paper, we are going to provide an integrated framework linking the income gradient hypothesis of obesity with biological, obesogenic, and environmental factors to explain this within country differences. And to do this, we utilize the measured body mass index, which is BMI, along with individual and household level data of over 800,000 men and women surveyed in the third and the fourth round of the Indian DHS which is properly known as the National Family Health Survey, and decompose these differences using the OHAKA blinder methodology. Coming to the results, we see that the explained uh, effect um, cont contribution explains majority of the change over time across all the groups and as well as region, whereas the unexplained effect does not play a very important role. Uh, and within these explained factors, we do see that there are gendered differences in the gendered experiences of this within country nutrition transition, we are able to show that biological risk, such as age and lowering of reproductive stress are correlated with higher overweight rates among women, but not so for men. And among men, it is the changes in access to obesogenic technologies, which are associated with the increase in overweight incidence. Also, we find that the type of risk factor differ within gender by region. So for example, among women, it is a reduction in reproductive stress, which is associated with increased overweight prevalence in rural areas where level of economic development is low, while in urban areas where the level of economic development is high, it is not the reproductive stress, but age, which is a more contributing factor for this increase in overweight prevalence. And similarly for men also, we see that on uh, for rural men, access to motorized vehicles basically is positively co correlated with overweight. And these vehicles enable greater income in generation and are more likely to be used by men. Whereas for urban men, obesogenic behavior such as reduction in smoking is also positively correlated with increased hours of TV watching. Hence, we propose that obesogenic technologies that are not ex non-excludable within the household, such as television, affects both men and women. However, technologies that are excludable like vehicle affect men more. Additionally, we find that the effect of uh, quality of health environment explains the majority of the change across all groups and region. So this is captured by cluster level factors such as urbanization and increasing uh, sedentary lifestyles. Overall, um, our results suggest that group-based and community-based approaches to uh, are required to stem the overweight incidence in developing countries like India, for example, um, nutrition education programs should include age and gender appropriate counseling services and also account for differences in intra-household access to obesogenic technologies to reduce overweight risks in India. These counselings need to be given to young rural women during reproductive health checkups, whereas middle-aged women and those who have completed their fertility are to be specifically targeted in the urban area. And for rural men, proactive campaigns like that create awareness on the importance of daily exercising may help in reducing this overweight prevalence. For urban men, strong counseling services to change behaviors is also required. Food and agriculture policies should also subsidize the production and consumption of healthy foods. Uh, lastly, we also need to include uh, investments in environmental resources that, in, um, that uh, uh, investment in environmental that encourages people to exercise to counter the reduction in physical activity, which is associated with the rising income. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. And I just noticed also the timing issue is that I got two different readers on my screen. So sorry about that. I think we are run out of time. So I please send over your comments uh, later on, please. Sorry, I have to move to the next paper on to the pandemic. Sorry about that. No problems, um, no problems, sorry. yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, can I invite the next speaker? Talking about uh, schooling, smoking gradient, please.
Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Okay, hello. Would you everyone. like to share your yeah, would you like to share your poster or slides? Yes. Okay, can you see it? Um, I'm Yuri Mavropoulos from the University of Macedonia in Greece. Uh, this is a work in progress. I'm going to present you some evidence on uh, the schooling and uh, small initiation gradient. This is a work in collaboration with uh, Christopoulou Rebecca and uh, Bufara Georgios. So, in this paper, we examine the relationship between schooling and smoking uh, initiation. Uh, previous studies uh, have focused mainly on time invariant variables of education and also they have followed a micro approach. In this sort of literature, we have many, many endogenity problems. For instance, third neglect variables that uh, come uh, in the relationship between uh, smoking and schooling, and of course, unobserved heterogeneity. So, we try to deal with these uh, issues by taking an aggregate approach. So, and uh, moreover, we also use a time variant variable for education and not a, a time uh, constant uh, one. Um, so we construct a smoking initi initiation life course histories by country, gender, and uh, corpus, also for education. Fixed effects allow us to clean out cross sexual differences across birth cohorts. And this is how we're trying to, at first uh, step, to deal with endogeneity. Our research question is about the effect of a certain population, that is a birth cohort, uh, acquiring more education um, on their smoking initiation rates. Uh, you, might, you might see figure, zero, uh, figure two, where one can uh, see that the relationship is um, non-linear and concave. Uh, which is in contrast, in contrast to most of the previous research, which uh, finds a, no, a negative uh, relationship when uh, they use uh, the time constant uh, education. Um, so we test for both linear and uh, nonlinear um, effects in our regression analysis. And uh, you can see that we have a statistically significant uh, effect of education on smoke in initiation when we use the linear uh, specification. Of course, since we have a time variant educa education, we also uh, control for age and age birth. And uh, you see in table one uh, these results. Um, and in table two, you can see uh, the non linear specification where we use. Uh, three variables for primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, schooling, uh, which separated by uh, years of schooling. For instance, primary variable is uh, from one to six years of schooling, secondary is from uh, seven to 12 years of schooling, and ter tertiary is for more than 12 years of schooling. And you can see that uh, in all cases, the primary uh, variable is um, lower than the secondary, but uh, all we, and we can see that as we go from primary to tertiary, we have an increase in secondary and then a reduce in tertiary, which is um, the confirmation of uh, what we see in figure two. In figure two. Um, so we will find that the effect is highest for men in all countries, lower for women in developed countries, and lowest for women in developed countries. Here is a, a small problem because we have more, uh, much more countries uh, coming from uh, a developing world because we use uh, GATS uh, data. Um, and we have uh, to further uh, fix this issue in, uh, in the next um, uh, step. And when we allow for only art, we find that the education effect is concave, that is, the smoking initiation of probability is highest in secondary school. So, uh, the next step would be um, instrumental variable technique. We're going to use uh, parental cohorts. And uh, of course, we're going 
to search a way to distinguish between education and free effects, which ob obviously compete each other in a school environment. And uh, so to find out uh, whether and uh, when uh, one of these two factors uh, prevails um, to the other. Uh, so uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, uh, owing to the time, sorry, we cannot take any questions. Please send the uh, comments directly. Thank you. And can I now invite the final speaker, Anna? Uh, could you uh, share your study with us? Thank you. Uh, Anna, sorry, Anna, are, are you here? Uh, Anna, if you are on the Zoom, could you unmute yourself? Okay, it, it seems Anna is not here. Do any of the co-author is here? Uh, any of the co-author of the paper is on the Zoom now? If you please unzoom, uh, unmute yourself. Um, okay, I, I can't seem to see Anna on the list. Or if so, I, I'm going to close this section. And it's really a great presentation today. Thank you so much. And also thanks for all the discussions you, uh, you provided. It's been really interesting section. I hope there will be more communication after section. Owing to the time, sorry that in the, to the, especially to the later speakers, I didn't offer you more chance to discuss uh, during the live events, but uh, I hope you will receive more feedbacks afterwards. Thank you so much for presenting uh, today. And I think that's, uh, I would say it's the end for this section. Thank you so much. Thank you.